to sit here and say that it doesn't happen and it's never happened, you're a liar and a coward to tell it. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is J.P. Willie. I'd like to thank some sponsors. Our wonderful, faithful sponsors are the ones that make this show possible, and I really appreciate them. And I hope that you, the listeners, will go visit these sponsors and uh, not only uh, show them that you appreciate them supporting the show, but but they are the best of the best. That's why they sponsor author stories. Daniel Kinney is the best middle grade author I've ever known. His project Gemini is a 10 book series involving the characters Pirate Ninja, Lovable Loser, Lunch Meat Lenny, and Olive Clark. They are distinct characters, each with their own separate stories, but all the stories exist within the same fictional universe. Start with Pirate Ninja, by day a normal quiet kid, by night America's newest crime fighter, a brave superhero known to friend and foe as Pirate Ninja. Project Gemini by Daniel Kinney. Bokira Brumley is a speculative fiction writer making stuff up on a trampoline in West Texas. When she's not playing with the quirky characters in her head, she's addicted to Twitter pitch events, writing contests, and social media in general. She is one of the best writers I know, writing uh, fantasy and sci-fi and doing some really, really cool, amazing things. There's a link to her Amazon page where you can uh, get plugged in with any number of projects she's involved with right now. Thank you to Bokira Brumley. The Honoria series by Patricia Gilliam. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Honoria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Varen is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Honorian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. It's the Hernaria series by Patricia Gilliam. Book one out of the gray. Go pick it up today. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks to editor extraordinaire Crystal Watanabe from Pico's House. She's one of the best editors working today. She's worked with the with bestsellers like Hugh Howie and Samuel Peralta and is in demand for her unique insights into genre fiction and her ability to make an author's words ring true the way the author intended. Visit Crystal at PicosHouse.com for her full range of services. You will not be disappointed. Crystal is the best. Also, there's a new collection from Project Entertainment Network, my favorite story podcast author anthology. Fifteen podcast hosts and authors share their favorite short stories they've ever written. Folks like Christopher Gold and Brian King, James A. Moore, Jay Wilburn, Chuck Buddha, Jonathan Mayberry, Armand Rosamelia, Jamie Engel, some of the biggest authors all in one epic release. It includes a brief, why is this my favorite story section from each author. It's the Project Entertainment Network presents my favorite story podcast author anthology. Also, the new series by Craig Martell and Scott Moon, Assignment Dark Landing, the Dark Landing series. Book one, Assignment Dark Landing is out. Book two, Ike Shot the Sheriff is also out now. This is a fun series. If you love sci-fi, if you love genre bending and genre mixing, this is like Firefly meets Tombstone. This series is incredible. Uh, by Craig Martell and Scott Moon, the Dark Landing series. A frontier world, one sheriff, all the action one spaceport can't hold. Dark Landing is the wild, wild west of known space. Go check out book one and book two now. Assignment Dark Landing and Ike Shot the Sheriff. As always, at the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Joe Willie on the show with me. Joe writes under the name J.P. Willie, and uh, he has a book out called Blood in the Woods. And uh, I have a feeling there's a really creepy story behind this one. Uh, welcome to the show, Joe. 
Hey, how's it going? How are you, brother? Good, good. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Joe. I appreciate this. A uh, couple of Southern boys. I, I appreciate the chance to to hang out with my uh, with my brethren from time to time. I really appreciate it. Uh, you taking you know the time out of your day to give me this opportunity. I'm really thankful. Yeah, well, uh, I'm excited. You've got a, a fascinating story. I can't wait to get into it. But before we can, uh, we always have to answer the first question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Uh, I think the my first memory of being a wanting to be a writer uh, was when I read uh, Stephen King's own writing, I think in like 2004, 2005. And uh, I never really dreamed of being a, a writer or an author. And honestly, on most days, I don't even consider myself that. I consider myself more a storyteller um, and, and, you know, that's really what I consider myself as. But reading on writing uh, really gave me some confidence to uh, start putting, you know, my thoughts because I've always had an active imagination. I've always been a good storyteller, a jokester, uh, and um, it just gave me the confidence to start putting uh, pen to paper when I did decide, you know, to move forward with writing my first novel. That book has been the gateway drug for many a writer. Oh God, it has. It is the. It is the. I don't know what's so great about it. I think what really did it for me, it wasn't necessarily the writing of the book. It was when I flipped to the the back and King gave several examples of uh, his writings, you know, in the three different stages. And when I looked at it, I was like, man, I was like, that sort of looks like, like straight out the mind on the paper. There's no like real fluff to it there's no you know churching it up it was just real raw and there was a lot of grammatical errors and a lot of ands and these and and i was like and then he showed you know how the edits came in next with his editor uh what his self edits and then it went to the final product and i was like wow uh, and his statement couldn't be any more true you know to to write is easy to edit is divine and that is the <laughs> truth man well, uh, I, yeah, yeah, that uh, that was a very eye opening uh, part of the process reading uh, how he uh, kind of a, a god among men of writers uh, and goes through the same stuff that we go through as as writers. And, uh, and also the first half of the book um, where it's kind of memoir, you know, where he's just kind of talking about his life and, and people that were uh, important to him and instrumental in building the, the storytelling muscles for him, you know, he talks about uncles and, and granddad and, and he talks about his, you know, his, uh, was it his granddad or his uncle's toolbox? Maybe it was his granddad's that he gave to his uncle. Uh, you know, it just, he uses, uh, he makes you feel like you're, you're, uh, you know him, you know, and if, if you know someone like that, then it all can't be magical. You know, it's something that anybody could, could attain. And I, I love that about that. Yeah, I think we all owe a little bit to, you know, the master, you know, of, you know, of this. Yeah, for, for that, I think it gave us a lot of just a confidence and just an extra push to start doing what we want to do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, where did you grow up, Joe? Uh, I'm from Hammond, Louisiana. I grew up, I was born in Covington, Louisiana. I grew up in Hammond, Louisiana uh, until I was about uh, 13 years old and I moved to Baton Rouge. And uh, once I graduated in 2000, uh, from Terra High School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I uh, joined the Army, and that's where I still currently am serving. I got uh, two and a half years uh, until I hang up the uniform and officially retire. So uh, I, I'm starting to see a small light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Hammond, Louisiana, for those who might not know, uh, it's on the, the north uh, northwest side of Lake Pontchartrain, right? Yes. And north of New Orleans and yep. uh, kind of between uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Yep. Uh, so uh, just down the road from us. We're just kind of uh, right down Interstate 55 from us. Uh, so what – was there anything that stands out to you about growing up in uh, in Louisiana and uh, Hammond and Baton Rouge uh, that, uh, that you can point to uh, as something that, that comes up in your writing? I think for readers who there's there's a lot of reviews that are coming out on Blood in the Woods and uh, I think it's the the way we speak some of our our slang and our lingo that we use down south I think it shows up uh, in my writings um, I like to base the stories that I write 
you know, off of really what I know. I mean, I'm comfortable writing stuff I don't know, but um, I, I really like to bring, like, you know, some type of spotlight to the South. Uh, I want people to know how we talk, you know, the, the way we are. And I think in my writings, like, uh, people pick up on that. Uh, a lot of Southern slang that most people don't know, and then the ones that are in the South, they pick up on it, and, and it makes them smile. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the... Uh, with you know the the internet and um, well at TV where we have you know fifty thousand channels now uh, there there really is this well even radio you know I, I remember as a kid that there were there were local radio stations and you only heard local DJs uh, now you turn on the radio if you still listen to terrestrial radio and uh, most of it is is canned programming that's coming from a studio in LA or you know somewhere like that and. Uh, we're we're losing a lot of regional flavor, uh, and and it's a good thing that we're all connected. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's something really important about retaining what makes a region different. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I appreciate that when an author really highlights and and tries to give people a window into uh, you know what what makes us different, and uh, and then you know through story. That bridges those differences into you know showing that we're all actually the same. Uh, but you know, I think it is important to highlight that. Indeed, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, were you a bookish kid? Or did you read a lot? Uh, so, uh, somewhat. I read when I was young. I ran the first book I remember reading. I think I was in sixth grade, and uh, my mom brought home. Uh, she went and bought me Bram Stoker's Dracula, and at the time, at the time, it was a little. Um, more advanced for for me, I guess, for the age. Some of the words I didn't quite understand, and when I didn't understand it, I would skip over it, uh, like the word. <laughs> but uh, that was the first book I ever read, and um, my family was always big into horror uh, and all that, like growing up. And um, I think I just always had a natural love for it, because maybe it was because of that book that I've always, you know, shown an interest in the horror, suspense, dark fiction. Uh, books that are out there and uh, but that's the first book I ever I ever read was Bram Stoker's Dracula and it's still one of my personal favorites to this day what do you think it is about horror that uh, that resonates with us uh, so much uh, I, I'm always fascinated to but uh, I've made this joke before that uh, some of my friends that write really dark horror uh, are some of the sweetest people you would ever meet in your life and, and I think uh, you, Stephen King even addresses that in that book uh, to, to keep bringing that up uh, that you know a, that he said that people always ask him, you know, about his childhood because they assume something twisted and dark happened. And no, it's just, you know, the way we wrestle with things. But what do you think it is, uh, Joe, that, that that turns us on to, to horror so much? I mean, there, there's so many different subgenres of horror. It's almost like listening to, like, music now, like, in the literary world, like... Like back in the day, like heavy metal was Ozzy Osbourne. It was like Black Sabbath. But now you say heavy metal, it's almost like, you know, like they consider, you know, like, like Creed or something, a like form of heavy metal. <laughs> and it's not. Uh, so I like for horror, there's so many, there's so many subgenres to it. But I think why we label it horror, it's because I, I think we love that feeling of the unknown. I think people... Uh, if they like to admit it or not, they they love the feeling that they get when they're watching something uh, uh, suspenseful, and you feel that that weight on your chest, and you and when something climatic happens or it like, gets exciting or there's resolve or whatever, like you just feel like relieved, and then that feeling can come back later on again in the film. Like Jaws is like the perfect example of it, and uh, I think people love that, uh, but most people who write in that genre. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't choose to write in it. Let's just say that. Uh, so if you're going to write in horror, I, I guess you got to be a lover of all subgenres and everything of horror and what it all entails to, to do it. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm uh, right at 10 years older than you. Uh, but the, the book Blood in the Woods uh, is really centered around some very specific things that happened in real life. And uh, I vividly remember uh, some of these events, and, and, and I probably remember the ramp up to it more than you because I was a little older than you. Um, but tell me about the story that, that bred Blood in the Woods. Yeah, Blood in the Woods is, um, 
it came it came to me because a lot of the stuff that readers across the globe were reading in the novel, uh, they did happen, uh, you know, to a certain extent. You know, as a storyteller, I had to weave the perfect amount of action and drama and horror uh, to make it what it is. Uh, but I believe that, um, the, like, what really kicked it off was when I got back from my second deployment uh, from Afghanistan uh, in 2006, and I was home on leave, and I came to find out about the crimes that were committed in the Hosanna Church in Ponchatoula, Louisiana. And Ponchatoula, Louisiana is not far from Hammond. They're separated by only several miles. And the crimes that were committed in that church, like, and most readers don't know that are reading the novel now, is what HBO based their hit TV show True Detective off of. But truth be told, there was crazier things happening during the late 80s, early 90s, growing up in that small town out there that people weren't aware of. And um, so that's when I sort of started thinking about possibly writing a book, was in 2006 when I found out about those crimes. Uh, because word on the street was, and I found this out like a year ago, uh, one of the guys that were convicted um, during the trial from you know the horrible things that happened in that church, uh, he actually lived on the street that uh, I grew up on, where all these weird and you know, like like just crazy stuff. If you read the novel, people are reading it. A lot of weird stuff was going on, but that guy apparently lived on our street or on the street next to it. So in 2008, I lost my uh, my best friend Jack. He lost his sister Jamie to a car accident. And uh, when we lost Jamie, I remember going back home to my street. Uh, in the book, it's called Ryan Road, but in real life, it's Lee Hughes Road. And I went there, and I stood in my old driveway, and I started reminiscing about when I was a kid. I was thinking about Jamie. I was thinking about Jack, all the friends that I hadn't been in touch with for years since joining the military. And uh, for the first time in my life, my ch childhood like truly became terrifying after everything that, that had come about. And so that's when I decided to start writing. And that's how Blood in the Woods was born, based off facts and true events that did occur. And it's all just mixed together uh, for the perfect just narration of coming of age and true horror. Wow. Um, well, first off, if you were uh, deployed in Afghanistan and, and serving there, and I would imagine you saw uh, things that a lot of us can't imagine. You know, war is, is hell that... Uh, uh, you know that term is 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 true for uh, you know for a lot of reasons, uh, but to to um, live through real horror uh, and 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 witness that, and then come home and start seeing that you know some equally or you know maybe not equally, but well yeah probably equally crazy stuff had happened right on your street. Um, how do you juxtapose those two things and uh, you know the 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 living it and then realizing that. Uh, that heinous stuff is going on at home too. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I know that in, in my writings, when writing it, I think uh, a lot of a lot of the violence uh, and graphic violence. Uh, it's been called extreme, like extreme form of horror, uh, by several reviewers and and blog, uh, you know, blogs out there and uh, horror websites. Um, I think just from being in the military, you know, I've been taught that violence solves everything, and I and I, I firmly believe that. And I think a lot of violence and, and uh, just um, some of ag aggressive writing, I think, comes out uh, a bit in, in my works. And I think that's just due to the life that I've been living for the, uh, the past 18 years. And, um, you know, you don't have to be in a war zone to be in hell. You know, there's people living a living hell you know, on the streets in a suburb, in a home right now. And uh, life is just scary enough. And I think the, with the novel Blood in the Woods, because it's so believable, and it is believable, uh, because most of it did happen, uh, I think that's what just makes it, you know, truly terrifying. And um, I guess that's uh, best I can answer that yeah. question on that. Yeah. Well, I remember in the probably mid '80s when when all of this kind of you know began to to reach a fever pitch. And, uh, I grew up in the deep South and the, you know, right in the Bible belt. And you heard stories of, uh, Satanism and, and all of this stuff. And, you know, uh, rock music and heavy metal music was evil. And, you know, people are, are, you know, becoming demon possessed because of this and people are having record burnings and, uh, you know, you can't play Dungeons and Dragons because you're summoning demons and, and all of this stuff. And then you start seeing, 
you know, uh, you know, documentary shows like 2020 and stuff like that. And they've got, you know, people that claim to have been, uh, you know, in, in cults and, and, uh, they're, uh, practicing Satanism and all this stuff. And it just, and it just keeps feeding into the frenzy. And, uh, you know, before you know it, you know, everybody's just going crazy. Um, and later in life, uh, it's easy to look back and just dismiss all of that stuff out of hand as, well, th- this was just a group of people that were just working themselves up into a frenzy. None of that was real. Um, and then you, you dig a little deeper and you realize, that, well, some of it was real. Uh, some of their reactions were overblown, uh, but there really was something funky going on there. Uh, what happened in your hometown? And uh what, what, what was the story that happened there? Oh, man, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, it started, I was about like eight or nine, uh, every every full moon, because I, I lived in a, in a rural area. We, we were country people, and we didn't have much money. My mom and dad went through a divorce, and we lived in the trailer. And on every full moon out there, and I know people heard it, and there was always some type of ritualistic drums going off like in the distance of the woods. You know, my mother used to listen to it once a month for several years it seemed like and then shortly after that there was a lot of um cattle mutilations that started happening across america because once blood in the woods came out and it hasn't been out long you know i'm you know i'm with the independent publisher Uh, i'm an indie first time you know nobody author and uh but people started reaching out to me all across america i had people uh reaching out to me via social media in, in ohio uh Arkansas. I just had a guy actually reach out to me, speak to me personally about some occult activities that were happening in Arkansas, and he read the novel and just hit home uh, to him. So I believe that was not just happening in Hammond, Louisiana. Um, It was happening all across the country during the height of the satanic panic. Uh, So the cattle mutilations started happening, and my grandfather, we had a dog named Rambo. And I remember the guy, uh, and hearing the stories, and my mother told me as I got older, you know, that my my dog uh, was accused of killing some of the cattle down there, and it didn't make any sense. And uh, it turns out that it wasn't, you know, any form of animal, that it was human. And it, this was like, and it was happening all over, you know, in the state of Louisiana. And I remember when the book first came out, got published, I spoke to the Hammond uh, Daily Star, and they ran an article on it. And the the editor that worked there, her name was Miss Lil, and she had wor- been working there for like 40, 50 years. And when the novel came out, she remembered everything that was happening. And But the, the issue was is that it was kept very, very hush uh, in the state of Louisiana uh, amongst a lot of people. I had actually went back to my hometown and did a video recording for a local TV show about it, uh, but they never aired it. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I, I can guess why they didn't. But, um, I mean, and, and I'm pretty sure you have stories, too, as you remember as well. I mean, it was just happening all over, uh, and I don't know why. And uh, to me, it, it was sort of a, like, phenomenon. I, I don't know if it was a phase people were going through or a certain generation that was acting out or doing what they were doing. But uh, Satanism was real. Uh, most, I wouldn't say Satanism, uh, devil worship was running rampant across the uh, U.S. at that time. And I remember Geraldo Rivera doing like specials on it like all the time. And um, I actually had a guy reach out to me. I won't say his name, but he worked somewhere out in New Orleans during this time in the early 90s uh, when he's hearing all the reports about all the occult activities going on in Louisiana and around the Hammond, you know, Ponchatoula area. And uh, he reached out to me and we talked on the phone. And I remember growing up as a kid that I had heard rumors that some guy was doing a report on the occult and they ran him out of town. Well, it turns out I'm 36 year old, years old now and I, I met the guy. I talked to him and that did happen. So when he was digging around, he said he went into a, a store and he came out and he had a knife uh, sticking in his seat with a note that said, stop asking questions. You need to get out. So it, it makes for very it, – it's, it's very controversial, man. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people get angry at me saying all this stuff but you know there's a story to be told and a a secret that doesn't need to be you know hidden because there was some crazy stuff going on during those years yeah uh you know growing up in the middle of that and uh you know from a very religious upbringing and uh, you know kind of hyper religious at points and uh uh it it bred a lot of fear in a lot of people and um it was never 
we always focused on on the the bad of it and that uh, all the evil that's out there. You know, there was a devil behind every bush and all that. And and you know, you would think uh, that religion would would choose to shine a light in those areas, but you know that. When, when people get worked up about things, they, they react in weird ways. Uh, so I walked around with that stuff for a long time, just uh, just really wary about things. And it wasn't until I began writing and and chose to, to write uh, a couple of really messed up scenes in one of my books where, uh, you know, there's a, a ritualistic sacrifice at, at one point um, that I kind of dealt with a lot of that fear and residual stuff that I was carrying around. And it's, it's very weird how writing about that and, and kind of living through the moment in storytelling uh, will actually kind of free up the writer. And maybe that's one of the reasons we love horror so much. It, it, it allows us to kind of come face to face to with some of those things that we're scared of. And uh, so I can only imagine what you went through uh, when you started kind of digging in and, and realizing all this was going on uh, under your nose. How did you go about uh, storifying that? Uh, like I said, I've always been a good like storyteller, telling jokes, you know, fibbing, always over-exaggerating, something that I saw. Like if somebody tripped and fell over a rock, I made it sound like they fell down a mountain. So – so and when I when I started doing Blood in the Woods, um, I, I plotlined everything first, and I still do that with all my works. If I'm doing scripts or if I'm doing a you know independent film, whatever, I plotline everything. So I basically write everything out by hand, and you know I break it down in certain chunks by act. And uh, when I did that with Blood in the Woods, I wanted to relive certain parts of my life, like my my fondest memories that I had as a child with my best friend Jack and my friends Angela, Justin, and Crystal, and a lot of other ones that I didn't put into the novel because I didn't have permission to because at the time I was writing it, it was like back in you know, 2007, seven, eight. And I didn't finish until 2009. Uh, we were, I was only using MySpace. I don't even think Facebook was around at that time. You know, I was still cutting codes and adding music to my MySpace page. And I, didn't, <laughs> I wasn't in contact with all my friends. And, uh, but I plotlined it. And, and I asked myself when writing the plotline, because I'm a huge fan of King and, and most people who write in this genre are. And um, I remember when I was plotlining it, I asked myself, because I'm, I'm a big fan of Stand By Me and coming of age uh, films and, and books. And uh, I was like, what is it? What is what is it really when a child loses his or her innocence? What can cause that? And when I had my answer, it was an answer. I really had my, my conflict uh, in the book and the theme that I wanted the, to focus on. And, you know, once I had that, then I just plotlined everything and I started putting you know, tidbits of horror and everything throughout, you know, the manuscript. And then it took me, once I was done, I sent it out for seven years, brother. It took me seven years for this novel to get picked up. And uh, I just, I knew I had something special uh, to tell uh, as a horror fan and a, and a movie buff. Like I knew that I had a story to tell. And um, once it got out, I'm sure you probably, the reviews and everything, you know, it's been described as the you know, a deadlier homage to it and Stand By Me and as one of the best coming of age horror novels of all time. So, you know, one of the um, I, I love those coming of age stories, uh, too. And uh, one thing I really love to see is um, this this kind of uh, camaraderie that the characters go through and you get this really warm, fuzzy feeling uh, and because it, it makes you remember your experiences as a kid, and then uh, when they go through horrible situations, you know, you, you kind of relive what it's like to go through that youthful angst. And um, uh, so, a, a great storyteller does what you did and alternates between kind of warm, fuzzy feelings and uh, you know, kind of kids being kids, and then drop them in the in the middle of these horrible horrible circumstances, and then you know, show them coming out of it, so that the the, the reader or the viewer gets a chance to to kind of go through a range of emotions. Um, what what was your uh, your 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 choice process? What what was the process like for you choosing to write uh, the extreme violent uh, horror parts that you did? Because it's been uh, you know some some readers are having very visceral experiences. Uh, so how did you decide to write it that way? And were there any hesitations in going? Uh, the places that you did? 
Oh, yeah. A lot of people that, that know me personally and like my wife, when she actually read it, you know, when it came out, she was like, she's like, how can you write something just like so dark? And, and so because it made my wife like sick, uh, like you said, it's and like people are saying it's warm and loving on one page. You turn the next page and then out of nowhere, it's absolutely like gut wrenching. Um, I really don't know. I think I did it. And I, I was able to write that type uh, of graphic scenes and stuff that's in the novel because I am a father of five children. And I believe that I was just as scared as the reader while writing it. And I put myself, you know, as a as a father when writing it. And I had to take many breaks during certain, you know, scenes that I was writing and putting together. But um, I believe the world is a, is a terrifying, scary place. And I wanted uh, to, you know, show readers the world if they hadn't experienced something, you know, like that before. And, and I had witnessed a, a, lot of, a lot of stuff in Afghanistan involving children that at the time, uh, you know, we couldn't do anything about. And, and I won't say what that is, but I, I know when writing it, I wanted sort of to bring some of the horrors that I had experienced with my own eyes into the reader's heads. So I sort of mixed it all in one bag, shook it up pretty good. And, you know, I believe as a soldier, you know, I have a dark sense of humor. I mean, we sort of do have to have that to do the job that we do. So I think it might be easier for me to go to very dark places than others. Uh, I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, it's very easy for me to do that. Uh, but once I hit a certain level of, of darkness, uh, it does affect me as a, as a writer. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you choose how deep to go and when to pull back? When, when do you when do you know, OK, that the readers had enough? I, I need to kind of dial back on this and give them uh, a chance to catch their breath. Is it uh, uh, is it a conscious effort or are you just kind of writing out the scene and letting it play out the way it comes to you in your head? I, I don't, man. I leave that up to my publisher or editor <laughs> because when 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 the uh, when I'm with Hellbound Books publishing now. And when they got the novel, uh, I mean, I mean, their title is Hellbound Books. So I had the editor reach out and was like, hey, Joe, they're like, man, this is getting a little too rough. We're going to have to <laughs> we're going to have to cut this. I was like, well, your name's Hellbound Books. It's like, what are you talking about, man? This is going to be awesome. Like, you know, what are you talking about? And, uh, you know, as the creator, as the writer, you know, um, I didn't really have a hard time with it because I didn't want to turn people away uh, from the story because I believe. You know, from readers and reviewers and fans of the novel, it's more coming of age than it is horror. And I think the only thing that really gives it, uh, that makes it fall into horror is just the imagery, the occult imagery uh, that, that's in the book. But when I write, I sort of don't know when to stop. So so when you get it, it's going to be straight from mine to paper if you're ever going to pick me up. And you're going to have to be the one to tell me, hey, Joe. This is where we need to do. This is what we got to do. This is what's going to make it great. And I'm very easy to work with because I believe, you know, whatever is best for business. Right, right. Um, is there any indication that stuff like this is still going on today? Oh, I, I'm not sure in, in our small town, but we, you know, hear of, you know, horrible occult practices and murders all over the, the world still to this day. So to, to sit here and say that it doesn't happen and it's never happened, you're a liar and a coward to tell it because you can just type yeah. in Google and you can pull up some horrible stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, what, tell me about uh, winding up with Hellbound Books. Uh, you, you wrote the manuscript and, and you, you worked on it for quite a while. Um, how, did, how did you wind up with them and kind of what was your, what's your publishing story? Well, I was with a publisher before, and uh, it was an independent publisher, just like Hellbound, and um, they ended up taking all my money. I had sold like uh, 300 copies of Blood in the Woods in two and a half months as a first-time author, and, um, and I didn't have a good editor at the time, and I wasn't happy with the book. I was actually pretty embarrassed by it, but uh, you know, I was young. I was just now coming into the literary scene. And I was just excited to have my work out there. You know, seven years is a long time. You know, some people are still trying, and they could be over decades. And I was a little naive with it, uh, but I'm a very fast learner, thanks to the military, and it takes one good time to burn me, and it never happens again. So uh, I left that publisher, and I retained my rights, and I self-published the novel for a while. Uh, and then I kept submitting because I knew that if I just got it into the right hands, man, that it would... It could blow up and possibly, you know, I could possibly be a you know, best-selling author. 
because I, I really don't believe as, as a writer or in storyteller that there's anything as a best-selling book. I believe I believe in best-selling authors because you can look at one book and it's written like like crap. You hate it. And then you look at it, but it's a real big name that's on the book. You look at the other book and it's better written, better story, but the guy or gal has no exposure, no nothing. Uh, but but I do believe the fault in that is it falls on the author and how they promote themselves and how active they are with their fans. And, you know, in the world of social media, you got to be out there like me personally. I don't tell people my religious views. I don't tell them my my political views. Like I keep that to myself because I believe trying to make a name for yourself in the industry that will that will, you know, hurt your sales or hurt your image when you're just you don't really have an image to make. You know what I'm saying? Right. You don't even have right. an image yet, so why damage it, you know, from the get-go? And um, I knew I just knew I had something special. And once I got it to Hellbound, they saw its potential, and they got it. And I basically asked uh, James Longmore, the guy who runs Hellbound, I was like, hey, man, what can you do for me that I can't do for myself? Right. I was like, right. what can you do for me that I can't do for myself? And, you know, I, I went with Hellbound because – uh, of the people that they have worked with before, like they um, they've had you know Richard Chismar who wrote uh, Gwendy's Button Box with Stephen King like on their podcast, and I think they might have like ran a short story with him in an anthology. So I went back to the independent scene again, basically for networking and wanting to get my work possibly fed through channels to authors who are more well established to get it to other people. You know, we all write and dream that we, you know, Random House or Penguin or Simon and Schuster is going to pick us up, but I mean that's that's like the the golden ticket and um it's just really I think the key to publishing is uh, I mean just to getting it to the you know the established literary giants and publishing houses that are out there, but you got to start somewhere. And uh, well, you know so well, and then yeah. Well, and the the traditional publishers are not even necessarily the golden ticket anymore. You know, there's uh, I, I talk to a lot of traditional published authors who are not making as much money as a lot of indies are. Uh, you know, it's a it, it, we really are in a writer's market right now where the writer has the freedom to either self publish or go with a small press or go with a traditional press. It all depends on the project and what's good for the author and what's good for the book. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. And uh, I read a quote somewhere. I think, I, I mean, I know Jack Ketchum. I think he just passed away. And I believe one of his quotes, because you, you just made my brain trigger and go to it because it's something you just said. I think his quote was like, hey, if you're, if you're in this for, for the money and, and glory, just do us a favor and get out and stop writing. And, and I, don't, I don't agree with that. I, I believe that uh, if, you're, if you don't know your worth and your work's worth and, and its potential, and if you're not willing to – I'm very competitive. So I want – you know, I'm not saying I'm the best at anything, but I know I have great stories to tell. And if I can get them to the right people – then, you know, I can possibly make a name for myself uh, in this industry. But I do believe that writers and authors, we do write because we do want to make a name for ourselves. We do want to be the next king. We do want to be the next, we want to be the next Koontz. We want to be, you know, the next Ketchum. I mean, if we didn't have those type of goals or those wants, we wouldn't, you know, have the, the literary, you know, giants we do now. Because if they would have had that attitude, then we'd have nothing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 for sure. I don't agree sure. with that statement. I don't like when people say that, uh, that, you know, just know your worth and and your story. And if you believe in it, just beat it down and chase down your dream until you slay that dream. And once that dream is dead, move on to the next one. Well, and, and you have to have a certain amount of, uh, you know, bravado uh, to, to even want someone to read your words anyway. You yes. Know what I mean? Like, like you, you've got to believe that you have something to say or we wouldn't be writing and trying to get people to buy our book. You know, it's that's, uh, uh, you, you know, if you want to write for yourself, fine, write for yourself, uh, you know, buy a diary. Um, but if you want, Indeed. if you want to if you buy want, a diary, if, write on yeah, the bathroom if, stall walls and leave my Exactly. Somebody. Exactly. But if you if you dare to write a book and ask people to buy it, then by God, you better have something to say. Exactly. I agree with you 100 percent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you also mentioned earlier that you write screenplays and uh, Blood in the Woods is, is being adapted. Uh, t tell me about your screenwriting and tell me about uh, are we going to see Blood in the Woods uh, on the screen? I hope that we do. Uh, we, we saw how successful it was at the box office uh, last year. And all the reviews out there on the saying, hey, you know, this is 
you know, a deadlier homage to it. Some people say it's better than it because, I mean, me personally, I'm not even like a quarter of the way through it. And I don't think I'm ever going to make it through because I just can't, I don't have the time in my day, a father of five kids. I write screenplays, I make movies, I write books, and I, I don't have the time. I, I think um, that... It's a doorstop of a book. What's that, sir? It, it's a doorstop of a book for sure. Yes, Yes. So there's been a lot of talks going on behind the scenes right now of getting blood in the woods into some type of film adaptation. But um, we need more exposure for the book. And that's why, you know, I reach out to, you know, people like you who do these you do great things for authors and for, you know, the, the scene. And uh, the more attention we get to it, you know, I mean, it's never a guarantee. And that's one thing I'm learning working with people in the film industry. Like nothing is ever a guarantee. You can have a movie filmed. You're ready to go, and they don't want to distribute it. They don't want to pick it up. Nobody wants to do anything with it, and that film will sit on the shelves until it rots away. Uh, but with the help of readers and the success that the novel, it, the small success that the novel is having, there is uh, hope. Uh, I'm really hoping that HBO gets a hold of it or, or, or sees it because it leads up in a true detective. And True Detective is a, an amazing, amazing show. The first season was based off the crimes that were committed in you know, the Hosanna Church. And uh, I think it would be an epic lead up into that. And um, but, you know, you never know. But, yeah, Blood in the Woods is supposed to be heading to script uh, this year. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, Joe, if, if people are not familiar with your work or just hearing about you for the first time, where can they go to find you online? Uh, you can go. You can visit my official website, uh, like www. You know, to HTTPS uh, official uh, You can hit me up on Instagram, Facebook. Twitter. Uh, I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm everywhere I want to be. Awesome. Well, Joe, you've got a fascinating story, um, and I love what you're doing, man. Uh, keep up the good work. We're going to send everybody to, to your website and to pick up a copy of Blood in the Woods. Um, I wish you much success, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I found Absalom in the parlor by the fireplace. Irving had encouraged his guests to reenact the famous Van Tassel party of the legend and tell ghost stories. The brandy poured freely, the men smoked and the chestnut tails of the region were trotted out one by one in parade. The White Lady of Raven Rock, the ghost of poor Major André, hanged from the tulip tree aside the post road, and, of course, the Headless Horseman. Did you ride that night, Brom? asked young Joseph Martling. Was it you that affrighted the schoolteacher? Brom sat, and all eyes were on him. Whatever the truth... I hope his son will forgive my part in it. There's nothing to forgive, said the son of Ichabod. It's a grand work, Mr. Irving, a grand fiction. On the mantel, a bronze clock chimed eleven. Tis almost the witching hour, said Irving. Time for all children to be abed, lest they be caught on the road. I would not be caught dead on the road tonight said Martling, who lived nearby. Why not, said I. Let us ride Ichabod's route back to Beekmantown in commemoration. The young men cheered the idea. I turned to Absalom. Would you join us? No, it's absurd. The sleepy hollow boys jeered at him. Absalom sighed. Very well, then. We will ride together as a group. The gloom that found us on the road was terrible. In those days, no gas lights lit the post road, and the way from Roost to the bridge crossing still wound past Wildy Swamp, fearfully black at that hour. I watched Absalom riding to my left. He was a thin, spectral thing in the moonlight. Idle talk died on our lips, and our small band rode with only the sound of horse hooves for accompaniment. There it is whispered Martling. The hanging tree. The old tulip tree twisted against the starry sky. The road broke to either side of it. 
That is where your father is said to have first seen the thing. My companion had slowed, gazing fearfully at the branches above. I saw something, he whispered. I saw a body swinging from the tree. Come now, Absalom. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Hurry up, then. Quick, before the horseman rides. You can't reason with a headless man. As if on cue, a wind rose. Branches tore and leaves swept the air. A terrible cracking laugh rose all around. Eyes opened and watched us from the deep. The faces of spirits appeared. Horrors rose from the Andre brook. Our horses whinnied and reared. Absalom grabbed my arm and pointed. The horseman stood on the slope above. He raised his hatchet. His army of ghosts fell upon us. My horse and I turned circles, terrorized and confused. Young Martling shouted, We have to make the bridge! and rode off. Make the bridge! cried the others as one, and our companions scattered, tearing up the post road with a clatter of frantic hooves. Make the bridge! The horseman gathered his form and lunged at Absalom. Young Crane dodged the blade, dug heels into the flanks of his steed, and fled. Cries of, Make the bridge! echoed all around. Where? cried Absalom, galloping into the swamp, his voice distant and small. Where is the bridge? Someone tell me! Help! He was gone before I could answer. Yet what could I have said? The bridge of legend is gone, torn down. It shall never be crossed again. I watched Absalom splash into Wildy Swamp, the horseman in pursuit. And I knew what his fate would be.